Due to a thread scheduling thing, we've accidentally found that Intel's efficiency cores are sometimes inadvertently inefficient. It's a very specific instance where this happens, but it's an interesting one. And it came up because we're testing Intel's new APO. It's a performance optimization tool that currently is heavily limited to just two games, but in one of them, we saw performance uplift on the 4900K of almost 30%. But the efficiency part of the discussion is super interesting. It's not normally the case that e-cores cause inefficiency, especially not in mixed workloads where they do their best or working on background tasks. The feature, if you can call it, it's more of a tech demo, but the tech demo that we're testing today is a pain in the ass to install. It has very limited use cases, but when it works, it works exceptionally well. And it basically comes down to thread scheduling. There's not a whole lot of magic here other than the magic of scheduling threads to begin with, whether Intel's not tweaking frequency, it's not doing screwy things behind the scenes. Uh, it all comes down to how it's mapping tasks to the threads on the CPU. And we were finishing the script right as Hardware Unboxed uploaded their own testing of this. And it's interesting because we each have a couple of charts that the other one didn't have. But in some cases, we came to similar results. So uh, you've got a couple things to look at for a full picture today. Let's get started, and we'll look at power consumption and the thread tasking stuff first. Before that, this video is brought to you by Squarespace. And visiting squarespace.com slash gamersnexus will give you 10% off your first purchase with them. We've built a number of our own websites with Squarespace, including our recently launched gamers.nexus site, where we list catastrophic PC hardware failures to inform subscribers of those failures. I built this site personally in a couple of hours by using Squarespace's Fluid Engine to move blocks around visually until I liked it. We also built our store website with Squarespace using its built-in e-commerce tools. And of course, we built a website for our CEO, Snowflake, because she demanded our audience know who really runs the show. Get to the core of your idea and spend less time on web design by signing up at squarespace.com slash gamersnexus or click the link below. So first up, Intel's new application requires a couple of key components to even work. First off, it requires a 14th gen CPU, but not just any 14th gen CPU. Uh, sadly, 13th gen has no official support at this time, and we were disappointed to hear that in a comment to Hardware Unboxed, Intel said it doesn't plan on supporting prior generations, even though they architecturally could. Additionally, BIOS compatibility with the dynamic tuning option is required. There's a Microsoft Store application called Intel Application Optimization. You'll use that to toggle this on and off. And there's a driver set that enables APO and dynamic tuning at the Windows level. And then you have to launch each game once before the option appears in the APO application. This was incredibly annoying to install. Maybe it's gotten better in the last week, but when we started testing this two weeks ago, there was really no documentation, officially anyway, and uh, Reddit was the best source for some of the uh, discussion about how to get it installed. So uh, you will need a board that supports the dynamic tuning option, and ours does, so th that made that part easy. But then in Windows, we ended up deciding to do a completely new and clean OS because we didn't want to contaminate our standard test operating system with a whole bunch of driver files that aren't really packaged. So it wouldn't necessarily be as clean to get rid of it all when we're done testing. So you go through the process of individually installing the INFs one by one and with the BIOS toggle and the Microsoft Store download, that's all that's needed. But at least at the time we ran this, there wasn't just some EXE that did all of those steps for you. This is also just very limited in capability. At the time we tested this, only Metro Exodus and Rainbow Six Siege are supported. Rainbow Six is definitely relevant, but this is still functionally a tech demo at this point. Oddly, Intel's APO webpage shows a massive scroll bar with tons of game options in the APO application screenshot. These include Tomb Raider, League of Legends, Hitman 3, Project Cars, and more. Although, to be fair, the text above it does say example only. So they're being ambitious. That's not actually what's supported right now. Right now, for CPUs, this is the support list for APO. It's the i9-14900K and KF, the i7-14700K and KF, and nothing for the 14600K or KF. And Intel 13th Gen is also just not supported. The 13th Gen not only works in the same socket, but is the same base architecture from which the 14th Gen, if we want to call it that, was refreshed. So it's odd to see no support here. The lack of the 14600K might give Intel some cover fire, though. Maybe this is all just coming later. 
Intel has attempted to answer this in its FAQ. They stated, why did Intel only choose to enable APO on select 14th gen processors? They answer their question saying settings within Intel application optimization are custom determined for each supported processor as they consider the number of P cores, E cores, and Intel hyperthreading technology. Due to the massive amount of custom testing that went into the optimized setting parameters, specifically gaming applications, Intel chose to align support for our gaming focused processors. At face value, they're not excluding the other options, they're stating it takes a lot of work to implement. And given the lack of game support, that appears to be true. It's also concerning because anything this manual is kind of a risk for getting dropped going forward, but we'll talk about that later. Intel notes that APO does not modify frequency behavior either, so this all should be happening entirely on the scheduling side. That's what we'll look at today. Intel's modern CPUs have a hybrid architecture design that involves efficiency cores and performance cores. Overall, this should be a good thing, assuming it works right, as the hope is that lower performance applications like background tasks can be assigned to lower performance, lower power consuming cores. In theory, the higher performance applications, the things that really need the P cores, the performance cores, should execute on the higher performing cores themselves, rather than being accidentally assigned to an efficiency core, which runs slower and consumes less power. So in an ideal use case, the E cores get utilized for things like background tasks or just low work, low, low intensity applications in general to reduce the overall power consumption of the processor when it's doing stuff that doesn't need it to be flat out. Let's take a look at the results. We'll start with looking at how the threads are remapped. We'll look at power consumption. Then we'll look at the gaming results. This first chart shows CPU utility as logged by hardware info with all of the cores averaged into P core average, E core average, and then the same, but without APO. And hardware info's utility number can exceed 100. It'll be a little hard to read some of the specifics on this chart, but they don't really matter. It's just to guide us into the direction we're going for the next few charts. Notice that the average P-Core utility with APO, shown as the blue line, is generally in the 60s or upper 50s. The E-Core utility with APO is nearly zero. As we add the P-Core and E-Core utility without APO, notice that the P-Core utility is higher than both the E-Core and the P-Core utility of the APO numbers. This can be confusing at first glance because the overall utilization of the non-APO test is higher. That's what we want. The CPU should be in use, so less utility isn't a good thing on its own. But those were averages, and like always, the problem with averages is that they mask deeper insights. Because they're smoothing over it all, we can't really see what's happening within. It's kind of like average frame rate isn't that useful when you're trying to get something like frame time performance, consistency, the general frame to frame interval where you might see peaking that gets covered up by an averaging pass. So. Uh, in this instance, utilization of the CPU or utility as an average has that downside. This chart instead shows the maximum CPU utilization of any single core. This isn't the CPU utility number that we saw earlier and instead is a more traditional utilization percentage. So 100% is the max value. In this chart, notice that the APO test has the P core max utilization in the 80s. That means at any given instant in time, at least one P core is loaded 80% or higher. The non-APO test is typically lower than this, often in the 70s to low 80s. And again, that's for the maximum single value of any given core that we're monitoring. That gives us a first glimpse at what's really happening here. It's better scheduling. In combination with the reduced overall E-core utility from the prior chart, APO is able to better map which threads the game executes on. Games spawn numerous threads with modern engines. Those might include game logic, physics, AI for NPCs, and a render thread, or things like that. Here, APO is helping the threads get better mapped to the more appropriate CPU cores, typically the more powerful ones. This would leave E cores theoretically available for background tasks, like watching a video or something. Next, we wanted to use the same data methodology to analyze the maximum E core utilization. With APO enabled during the Metro test, the maximum E-Core utilization with, again, a maximum value of 100% was typically 10%, with occasional peaks higher. Plotting the non-APO result, we see E-Core utilization was often in the upper 50s to low 70s, typically in the 60s. We want to see high P-Core utilization during heavy loads, and because the game doesn't necessarily know which threads to assign the work to, we're ending up with an unoptimized execution of the application, 
lower e-core utilization with the APO result is part of the key to what's improving overall performance. It's just unfortunate that it takes an application to do this. It's not third party on a technicality, but it is something you have to download separately and it's in Windows. We also did power consumption testing with this really cool device. We bought this from Elmore, Elmore Labs, and this is an interposer. So we use this to sit between the power supply and the motherboard with an additional set of cables to then capture and interpret and analyze the power consumption of whatever devices we connect on the other end. In this instance, it was EPS 12 volt cables. So we're able to, with this PCB sitting in the middle, capture the data from the PSU into the EPS 12 volt cables, therefore into the CPU itself uh, with some VRM efficiency asterisks there. And overall, we get a cleaner capture than what something like Cardware Info might offer, where sometimes uh, the accuracy is not quite the same. It's better, it's worse, it depends on the generation we're in. But using a hardware level capture is always a surefire way to just get something reliable because you can't really screw with this at a BIOS level. And also current clamps, those help too. Now the reason we did this is because we want to capture the current load and the power consumption of the CPU and plot that against the duration of the test. Performance is getting a boost here and one of the possible outcomes of that is that power consumption might go up, but this is supposed to be an optimization thing. So we wanted to make sure Intel wasn't doing anything screwy with it, even though they said they're not tweaking the frequency, there could still be something going on there, and hence the reasoning for specifically looking at power. Here's a chart for the same Metro Exodus test. With APO, we measured power consumption during the workload, typically around 120 watts. Remember that power consumption in a gaming load is often lower, but not always, than an all-core production workload like Blender or compression, decompression, certain code compiles, or use cases that are more production focused. Plotting the power consumption without APO, we typically were in the range of 170 to 175 watts, with a few spikes nearing 300 watts. The APO test's highest spike was around 220 watts. This application from Intel seems to have tempered the power consumption of the CPU as a result of the more optimal core loading, that distribution of work across the CPU's threads. And it's a little bit ironic because the efficiency cores here were actively hurting the efficiency. That's not always the case, but in this instance, it was. That's because the E cores here, you can think of them as sort of blocking access to the P cores. They're getting in the way of work that in a pure gaming scenario with nothing else going on, it really needs to just go to the P cores and it needs to saturate and load those as close to 100% as it can get until it hits some other bind because you don't want performance sitting on the table if all you're doing is playing a game and nothing else. You want the, at least one component has to be pretty close to 100% loaded. So you take your pick, CPU or GPU normally, and when it's gonna be CPU bound, you want those higher performing cores to be the ones that get the workload. Now individually, e-cores themselves are more efficient it's just sort of the, this interesting combination of things that makes them get in the way, resulting in an efficiency. And efficiency, just to define it here, uh, you could look at it a few ways, but the normal way is sort of the performance per watt. How much of a unit of work do you get, whether that's frame rate or render time or whatever, out of the power going in. We're organizing the performance test by most impact to least impact. Metro Exodus saw the most impact, despite having faded from the gaming conversation in recent years. Look at Rainbow Six next. The first test is at 1080p low and using an RTX 4090 with a 14900K. This is as a proof of concept to try and find a difference by creating the heaviest CPU bind we can. We found Metro Exodus to run at 293 FPS average without APO or 364 FPS average with APO. That's an uplift of 24% from toggling the feature on. We had trouble getting traditional logging tools to work in Exodus due to its own logging utility and its age, so we used the in-game tracker. This spits out 99th percentile lows, which were 171 FPS without APO or 196 FPS with APO. It's a good start. With Metro Exodus again, but this time using the RTX preset, so much higher settings, the APO test ran at 189 FPS average against 147 without APO. This game is clearly a good candidate for what Intel's trying to do here. The uplift is 29%, it's even larger than at low, and part of that is because ray tracing functionality can actually put additional strain on the CPU, uh, it depends on how it's executed, but this may explain the relative improvement against low. 99th percentile lows were identical here, 
and the standard deviation run to run for the lows is high enough with this game that these are definitely within error, but the average is looking better. Now we get to the less exciting results. For our CPU reviews, our Rainbow Six Siege benchmarks use 1080p very high for testing. This produces charts like these. Frame rates often exceed 600 FPS, especially on high-end CPUs here, so you can see why we go with very high settings. First off, there's actually still a good amount of scaling up the stack here, so we're still seeing differences. And secondly, at some point, it does become ridiculous and less useful to the majority of users. These settings provide good scaling while balancing the fact that, as a game that's actually still relevant in the modern landscape, once you're at 600 FPS anyway, most users would probably run the higher settings rather than try and scrape another 50 FPS out of it. Here's the APO chart. This was the only other game supported at launch of APO, and it's a lot less interesting. The improvement in our 1080p very high test was much lower at 702 FPS average against 655 FPS average. That's a 7.2% uplift. At 1440p, enabling APO gave us a boost of 3%. That points to the limiter for the prior 1080p test, which is the GPU. But just to be sure, we can further prove that. This is the new metric we've been pushing lately. It's GPU busy. This shows the amount of time per frame that the GPU is spending working. A lower busy time means less GPU load. The reason this is helpful outside of just prior FPS values is to ensure that there isn't some other more complex CPU loading behavior going on since we're playing with how the CPU behaves by using this application. In this plot of the 1080p results, we can see that the GPU is typically at a one-to-one -one or very close to it with the total frame time. This means that the GPU is busy for nearly the entire frame rendering process. So in other words, we're primarily GPU bound when APO is enabled at 1080p very high. That's why, or at least partially why, we're not seeing additional scaling like we saw with Metro. You'd get a larger boost at low settings if you valued, say, 800 FPS or something, or high 700s as opposed to higher graphics quality. But even there, GPU Busy eventually comes into play. Here's the power consumption in Rainbow Six Siege while using the method we described earlier. The result with APO bounced around in general, but was often in the 50 to 60 watt range. The largest spikes were to 150 watts to 170 watts, which occurred during lower GPU segments of the test process. The result without APO had an extended spike to 230 to 280 watts, but overall was around 50 to 55 watts. That has it higher than the APO result, but because we're not as bound on the CPU and thread scheduling this time, the overall impact is much lower than we saw previously. Now relating to Rainbow Six, again, we saw a hardware unboxed video go up and uh, our gaming side tests were pretty similar in most ways. We had a couple different charts or discussion points for uh, some of these other features we talked about, but they had specifically Rainbow Six rerun at I think it was low settings. So we'll point you over to them if you're really interested in that, you're curious, how does Rainbow Six do at the lowest possible settings to create the most CPU load? Uh, if that's the way you want to play the game, they have those numbers for you. We'd be happy to uh, sort of split the coverage here because both of these videos contain some good points to APO and give you a pretty complete picture from two different groups with very similar, in some ways at least, conclusions. So this tech demo works. It's just very limited for what's supported. And that's true on all fronts. You're limited by operating system. You're limited by BIOS compatibility, which should continue rolling out. Limited by the uh, CPUs themselves to not even all 14th gen CPUs right now today anyway but also not even 13th gen, and you're limited to games. So there are a lot of limitations here that we, we really don't think this is, although I've probably used them interchangeably throughout the video, uh, this APO setting is really not fully deserving of the word feature. It's not quite there yet. They're trying to get it there, but it really truly is more of a tech demo with such a limited rollout. Now, in this regard, it definitely should not be considered a given feature unless the game you care about is already supported. In other words, we wouldn't buy a CPU with APO as the fulcrum of the decision. If you're between an Intel 14th gen CPU and AMD, and this is like the one thing that makes you maybe reconsider Intel, unless you're playing Rainbow Six Siege, but more importantly, Metro Exodus, uh, then it really has no, it shouldn't have any weight because we don't review promises and uh, who knows how well they're gonna maintain this going forward and continue adding games. That's always the problem with heavily manual processes, things like SLI profiles. As the technology ages, 
the likelihood they continue adding games is low unless they can get it more scalable and more automated. But Intel themselves said it was basically a hand-tuned approach. There's a lot to be said for hand-tuning. It's kind of working here. It's just that there's more of a risk that it gets dropped. But it does work, so that's cool. It's also, though, pointed out that the scheduling sort of jumble that comes out of having a hybrid architecture design, although overall it's a good concept, uh, the scheduling jumble can create scenarios where your overall efficiency goes down by accident, and that's because software is complicated. This works better than just turning off e-cores because they're still there and they're still available for background tasks or just if whatever you're playing or working in can better leverage them than the two scenarios we showed today where actually rescheduling things and using APO is beneficial. So we would favor this approach over a toggle for e-cores and BIOS, which is more of a, although you get the scroll lock setting on some of these these days too, but uh, it's just that it's not supported enough yet to really have any weight there. So we'd say at this point, again, don't buy based only on APO. Very disappointing, the limited amount of support they have. If Intel branded this more appropriately, like by calling it a tech demo, then uh, the, probably fewer people would be disappointed that it doesn't work on their last gen CPUs. But that's really the biggest problem here is that if Intel's gonna roll this out at all, the marketing power isn't in pushing those two games with a couple of brand new CPUs that were generally poorly received, although maybe it's seen as sort of a way to try and push them in front of more people to, to revive some of those sales. The real marketing power, we think, is in Intel saying, hey, we went back in time and we made this work, even though it's hand-tuned with the 13th gen and it works with the 14th gen. And look, this is a manual process. It's extensive. It takes a lot of testing and fine-tuning. So it doesn't work in a lot of games yet, but it does work on these two families of CPUs. And maybe they can even go back to 12th gen, but 13th is the one that's particularly interesting just because uh, 14th is literally called refresh. Like that's part of the official naming and messaging for it. So it, its basis, you would think, is compatible. And Intel hasn't given a technical reason it's not, other than it takes a lot of time to implement, which fair enough. But it's just there's so much more on the table here that Intel could pursue. And we think it's worth them trying to pursue it. Otherwise, this just gets lost to time as a, that was cool, and then no one talks about it again. So anyway, that's it for this one. Thanks for watching. As always, support us directly on store.gamersnexus.net by grabbing one of our solder mats, mod mats, or other items. Or you can go to patreon.com slash gamersnexus to help us out there as well. And again, we've got the website relaunched at gamersnexus.net if you want to check out some article versions of our recent coverage. Subscribe for more. We'll see you all next time.